Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here and you don't normally watch my videos, this little fella here has decided to perch upon my face. He decided he wanted to get involved in this little chat about my cervix, so. It is currently Saturday evening and I've poured myself a big fat gin for this one. This video is probably the most important video I'm ever gonna make on my channel, so if you are new here, and you don't know me already, my name's Helen, but you can call me Nell. I'm 30, and a few years ago, at the age of 27, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust are the leading UK cervical cancer charity, and they are running a campaign between the 20th and the 26th of January, trying to smear the taboos around the subject of cervical cancer. People find the topic of anything in that region quite um, embarrassing and whilst I am naturally quite a shy person when it comes to talking about anything like that my experience is what has inspired me to make a video like this so I really hope that you take something away from watching this and I'm just going to get straight into it now and tell you all about everything that happened to me. Now the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to split it into three videos so we're going to do a short video today um, telling you all about everything that led to me being diagnosed with cervical cancer. The second video is me going to be telling you everything about the effects that it had on my fertility, early menopause and things like that. Then the third video will be a Q&A so you can ask me questions. I honestly don't mind how personal they are because I feel like knowledge is power definitely when it comes to things like this so I am more than happy to divulge everything. I am just your normal, average girl from Bolton who has had a bit of a shit time and I want to tell you about it hopefully make a bit of a difference wherever I can. Now just a bit of background information about me I am the middle child of five children so I come from a very big family but cancer isn't something that has ever like cropped up or being something that I've ever felt like I needed to be aware of. In 2015, I received my invitation to my first smear test. Now, I remember what my life was like at that time. Um, I was really busy. I was working as a customer service advisor um, full time, and then I was working overtime as well. I had been with Tom at this point, who is my husband now, for about two years. I'd just had a chat with him around about this time about, you know, oh, when do you think you'll be ready for children? And at 25, and some of you might be able to relate to this, I think you know as a woman when you are ready to have children. You might not even be in a relationship, but I feel like your body knows when you are starting to get that. They call it the maternal clock is starting to tick or something like that. And... I definitely started to feel like that around the age of 25 and I had a chat with Tom. He definitely wasn't thinking about children anytime soon. He was only 23, which is completely understandable. I don't think I would have been ready at that age. So I thought to myself, right, I don't want to be in the job that I'm in for the rest of my life. I uh, started to think about things that I would be good at and um, I started to think along the lines of teaching. So. I left school with not very many qualifications and I thought to myself, right, I'm going to go back to night college, I'm going to get those qualifications that I didn't get in school because I hated school and I didn't take much interest in any of the subjects, only the ones that I really liked, like French and Irish, I think I got, I did all right in English, but maths and science, no. Uh, but I was working full time, doing overtime and I was at night college and um, this was all to get onto a course to do teaching, so I had, my, I had a five year plan by this point. I was thinking, right, I'll qualify as a teacher by the age of 30. Tom will probably be ready for children by that time because he'll be about 28 and in a good stage in his career and everything. And I started to track my periods on an app on my iPhone. So I download, downloaded something called Ovulation Cycle or something. And I thought, right, Tom's not ready for children yet. I'm going to go and bag myself a career in something that I think I might be quite good at. And in the meantime, I'll be tracking my periods. And then when he gives me the go ahead, I know when I'm ovulating and all the rest of it. I like, I had my full on psycho plan, right? But when I received this letter, I 
didn't really give it much thought. Um, I had known about the Jade Goody story and about her dying at the age of 27 and everything, but I don't think I ever thought that I would ever have to worry about cancer. Um, I didn't know enough about it to know that every single cancer wasn't genetic or I just had never given it much thought and it see it sounds so ignorant now saying that um but it but I'm just being completely honest so my letter got put to one side and I thought yeah I'll book it when I've got time and it was only about 12 months later when I was having a chat with my friend Lauren she was actually one of my bridesmaids we went to go make a coffee in the office at 10 a.m like we always did and she mentioned that she'd just got her letter through for a smear test and I think she'd either asked me about, she'd either asked me what one was like or she'd said, oh have you had one? And I said, no I've had my letter but I've not booked it yet, I just keep forgetting or said something like that I think. And I think she said something along the lines of, oh you need to book it kind of thing and I thought, yeah she's right I do. And that's when I booked my smear test. Went for my smear test, it was for me, painless, um, I'm not somebody that particularly likes showing that to a nurse but I didn't feel overly embarrassed considering I'm from a family of five girls and we are all ve like we are all very very private around each other. I know a lot of people that grow up in a house full of girls um, would be quite open but none of our sisters have ever seen each other's boobs like literally we all shared bedrooms and we would have been mortified if anybody if any of us had seen each other like we were quite private and um my mum's always been that way my nan was always that way and I think it was just the way that we grew up and so yeah opening your legs in front of a stranger isn't great is it it's not the nicest thing you're gonna ever do but it was important, it's something that I'd left and not really thought about. So yeah, I went for my smear test, it was over in five minutes, absolutely fine. I received my smear test results and the letter said that my cells were normal and um, I would be contacted in another three years time to go for my next smear test. So I wasn't due a smear test until the age of 28. In my mind, receiving that letter meant that I would never have to. I like. I wouldn't have to worry about the possibility of getting cervical cancer for another three years, and they'll check me at that point, and everything will be fine. So I got my letter. I was happy, and I got on with my life. Everything was going fine. And so I'd been to college, got the qualifications that I needed to do to get onto my course, and I was a year into my course now, and absolutely loving being back in in education with a new mindset to what I was like in school. Like I hated school, but I loved this and I felt in such a good place in my life. Honestly, I can't explain to you how good it felt to, fit, how good it felt to not have achieved much in school, but always knowing I was much more intelligent than my qualifications showed um, when I left school. I was in a really good place. And the first thing I remember happening was I was laying in bed and um, it was like a Saturday morning. Tom and I were chatting in bed and I got this pain on the left side, um, sort of near my hip and it was quite low down. I wasn't due on my period. I knew exactly where my period should be and they were like clockwork every single month. Um, it was nothing to do with periods but I did suffer with IBS at the time so for those who don't know what IBS is, it's irritable bowel syndrome and it can be triggered by different things that you eat. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I've eaten something a bit funny and it's caused this pain, but it was like a really sharp, like stabbing pain in my left side quite far down. It lasted about three or four seconds, went away, never happened again. The next thing I remember was about a month to two months later, I'd gone to Manchester for my best friend's birthday. So I drove to her house on a Saturday afternoon towards the end of May time. This is May 2016. And we went for a day session in Manchester. We all got dressed up, went out for drinks. Um, it was a really sunny day. I remember just having the best time ever. And I'd left my car at her house because we'd gone having drinks and then I was just getting a taxi home later on at night. So the day after, Tom dropped me off at her house to go and collect my car. And 
I find this bit really hard to say out loud because it's quite embarrassing but I'm not going to help anybody by telling half a story so um, I was driving along, um, driving home and I, f I felt, well at the age of 25 if you need a wee you'd have to push for a wee um, and I'd never had any bladder problems or anything like that or been incontinent so I didn't need to worry about things like that really so this that happened was very different to when your period starts um, and you feel that happen it was like mm, it was like liquid a really thin liquid um, and and it smelt really really bad um, and I was thinking what the hell has just happened um, and so I pulled up outside the house Tom had got home before me so he was sat on the couch as I walked in and I said and I was really really open with him we've always had an open relationship I see Tom as like my best friend and I walked into the house and I said and that's ex I remember exactly what my words were I said there's something not right with me down there and he went, what do you mean? I said, I don't know, like, there's something not right. So I've gone upstairs, uh, gone to the toilet. The liquid that I'd lost was like a really thin liquid. Um, but yeah, I just knew it wasn't normal for me. Definitely not. I just remember a couple of weeks later, Tom being close to me as couples do he said what's wrong what like he was asking me what was wrong because probably I wasn't being as affectionate with him as I usually would be and I said to him I really don't feel good about myself at the minute after that happened the other week and I just don't really feel very nice and he said well do you not think you need to go to the doctors then and see what's wrong with you type of thing and I said yeah I'll, I'll book an appointment it was only him telling me that that made me think, oh yeah, I need to go and find out what the hell's wrong with me sort of thing. But because it had only happened once, I didn't worry about it too much and I'd already had a smear test. My periods were completely normal. This was 12 months after having a clear smear test result. So cervical cancer was at the complete, like not even, hadn't even entered my mind by this point. And I'm thinking, I wonder if I've used something in the bath or in the shower that is um, that has disagreed with me. Maybe I've used something fragranced. Maybe I've got an infection or something. And I booked an appointment. So just before work one day, I went and saw my doctor and he asked me what the problem was. It was a male doctor and he's been my family doctor since I was a baby. So, But I don't think I've ever had to talk about anything this personal before. I don't know what made me be so vocal and so honest about what had happened but the only thing I can think of is that it was like fate that I opened up about it because like I said I am quite a shy person so he asked me what had happened and I just told him I said I was driving home one day and this liquid this liquid happened and I don't know what it was but it really didn't smell right and it only happened once um and I just said I'd had this stabbing pain, but I think it's IBS. Sort of trying to find reasons why these things were happening to me. Because I think sometimes we feel a bit like we shouldn't be going to the doctors when we don't really know what's wrong with us. We feel like we're wasting their time, we're wasting our time, but they're the doctors, they're the experts, and you need, if something isn't right for you and your gut is saying, book a doctor's appointment, just go. Like, you are not, just go to your appointment. Um, but back to what I was saying, and I told him about this liquid discharge. He looked back on my records and he said, oh, I can see you had a smear test, I can see you had a normal smear test result only 12 months ago. Um, but the nurse is in today, and she's got an appointment free in about 10 minutes. So if you go and wait in the waiting room, she'll shout you through in 10 minutes and she'll just take some swabs. She'll do thrush swabs and things like that and um, have a look for any bacteria or any infections that are going on. So I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I went and sat in the waiting room. Within five minutes, I got called in and the nurse just asked me to get, to take off the bottom part of my clothing and to lie on the bed and cover myself up. 
very much like a smear test she put a speculum in and then swabbed for infection and stuff like that and she said to me oh are you on your period Helen or are you due on your period I said no I've got an app that tells me exactly when I'm due I'm not due for a couple of weeks yet and she said there's a little bit of blood that I can see so do you mind if I just go and get the doctor and get him to come and have a look because I said yeah fine so I lay there and he said Helen, do you mind if I examine you? The nurse will stay here as a chaperone. So the nurse came around on this side and held my hand and he did some examining. It feels a little bit bulky. I'll tell you what, Helen. He said, I'll tell you what, um, the nurse is going to take some details from you now and then instead of going back into the waiting room, just pop, in, pop back into my room. So me, oblivious by this point, I just go back into his room and... Um, I sit down and he said right I'm just going to put you on a referral to the hospital because I want I want a gynaecologist to take a quick a, a better look at what's going on he said I think it's just an infection or something that I can't see um, but we need to get to the bottom of what this discharge is so I'm not worried you've had a smear test but I am going to refer you to the hospital. I think I only realised the seriousness of it when he said um, you just need to go out of here now and knock on the door next to reception and there'll be a lady in there that um, makes the referral appointment. And I was thinking, why why isn't he just telling me that I've got thrush? Or why is he not just telling me that everything's all right? Or giving me some antibiotics or something like that? Why am I having to be referred? And that crossed my mind. But still, at this point, I'm not thinking anything serious is happening. When... When I knocked on the door and after I'd seen this other lady that who I'd never seen before because I'd never had anything wrong with my health, um, she gave me my letter that told me where my hospital appointment would be, which was in which was for in a week's time, and it said I was going to be having a colposcopy on this letter. Now I didn't Google that to see what it was or anything like that. Um, the only time I started to feel a little bit like what was when she said good luck to me as I was leaving, right? to work went to work as normal and I rang Tom on my way in and I said he said my cervix felt bulky what the hell does that mean and he's like oh I don't know but don't worry like they're going to check you out and see what's wrong don't worry about it they're being thorough and just checking um and I was like yeah yeah and I started crying and I have no idea why because I genuinely did not believe there was anything wrong with me at this point but I do remember feeling a bit worked up and then I was fine, I went into work as normal and everything was fine. I didn't think about it again until my until the day of my appointment. So my doctor's appointment was on the 5th of July 2016 and then on the 12th of July 2016 was my appointment at the hospital for a colposcopy. So I walk in and the receptionist is there and I gave him my name and everything. Go and sit down in the in the waiting room of the women's health department and Tom's with me. So we sit down and then the nurse comes and grabs me and says, Helen, can you come into this other room, please? Um, you've got to come on your own. Is that OK? I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And she said, a student nurse is going to come into the um, into your appointment. Is that OK as well? I said, yeah, yeah, fine. So I walk off into this other room and what was making me laugh was Tom was sat on his own in the women's health department. So he must have looked like a right weirdo. So I'm texting him from the room that I'm in and I'm like laughing at him saying, haha, I can't believe you're sat in there by yourself. You must look like a freak. Like you look like you're not meant to be there. So he's texting me back, back and we're like just having banter backwards and forwards. And then I see this doctor come through and I swear to God, he was about six foot seven. He was massive, right? And I'm thinking, you're about to look at my cervix. What the hell? So I text Tom and I said, John Coffey's just walked in. If you don't know who John Coffey is, he's John Coffey from the Green Mile. Look him up. That's what this doctor looked like. Not nervous, in the slightest, just laughing. Anyway, I go into my colposcopy and I lie down, much like a smear test, take the bottom half of my clothing off, and there's a nurse called Sarah, lovely lady, and who was in her like early 30s, and this student nurse who was lovely as well. Helen, I'm just going to shine this light in now, and it just means that I can see everything a little bit more clear. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And I think because two nurses were holding my hands, and I was lay there, and I was in hospital, the seriousness of it sort of hit me. And I didn't even feel upset, but I just felt tears rolling down my face, and I thought, Helen, 
why are you crying but I just couldn't help it I can't explain it it's just I feel, feel like it just all happened so fast and I quickly sorted myself out and like stopped crying do you Helen do you mind if I take a sample of tissue so I said no not at all and I said no that's fine I thought well, I can't really say no can I like no don't take any tissue I didn't know what bloody tissue was at this point I didn't know that that meant taking a biopsy and checking for cancer like I I have no experience of ever being ill or ever having anything wrong with me so I don't know what these things mean so after about 10 minutes of being examined and him taking the tissue sample and everything or the biopsy if you like um he said right okay Helen you can put your clothes back on now and we'll do, and I'll just leave you to it so I said yeah fine so the student nurse walked out the nurse walked out and the um and the doctor walked out so he was called mister so I knew that he was like an important guy I can hear him whispering now normally when you go for any examination like that they just shut the curtain and leave you to get dressed and you don't hear anything but I heard whispering behind the curtain even at this point I wasn't worried but now looking back I know why they were whispering I put my clothes back on um put my work pass back on so I was because I was due to go and work straight after my appointment Tom was going to drop me off and I sat down on the little plastic chair that they have in the hospitals and um he's just looking at his screen like this and he's typing something and I'm thinking oh he's just going to give me like a sheet or something some antibiotics and send me on my way um so yeah he's typing away and he turns to me and he says um, unfortunately I think there's a serious problem I think what I can see is cervical cancer and he said it to me like that what the hell do you do with that information do you cry do you I'm sat there on my own 27 year old girl thinks she's got a life all planned out thinks that everything's going to come to her easily and she had a whole life ahead of her and within a split second it just my life just turned upside down um imagine getting that news oh, trying to explain what it's like to get that diagnosis is so hard i start crying and the nurse starts hugging me and she starts saying Helen have you got anybody with you is there anybody with you and I said yeah my boyfriend's in the in the waiting room so she goes to get him and the doctor says grab Maria as well and Maria was the Macmillan nurse at this point so um they went to grab Tom and so Tom walks in and he sort of like just peeps his head around the door and like stands there and looks at me and I said he thinks I've got cancer and and I was looking at him like I remember feeling so helpless and I was looking at him like do something please like tell him he's not right or something like that um and Tom just really calmly just said well how often are you wrong about this sort of thing and he said well I can see it with the naked eye so um and I'm very very rarely wrong about these things but Tom comes and sits next to me and he's hugging me and he's rubbing my hand and he's like rubbing really like rubbing my hand like and I just feel so desperate I could not explain it, it felt like it felt like I was watching it happen it's so weird now to think back at that moment in time and um just how crazy it all was but I felt numb is the word completely numb Jade Goody popped into my head first person that popped in my head Jade Goody um, and I just couldn't believe what was happening I couldn't believe that it was real uh, and so after speaking to the Macmillan nurse for a little bit and getting quite a lot of information and a lot of leaflets given to me we left the hospital and I got told that in three days time I was going to have an MRI scan which would determine how far or how yeah how far my cancer had spread um, and how serious it really was 
but he knew just by looking it was at least stage 1B um, because he could see the tumour um, and he knew it was however big um, it needs to be to be stage 1B. And then I had my MRI scan three days later after <sighs> telling my mum, which is a blur now, I, I can't even really go into that because I can't even remember how it happened. I can't remember having that conversation with my mum. My mum rang my dad and told my dad because I couldn't. I text a lot of my friends. Can you believe that? I actually text that news. My head was just absolutely mashed. I feel quite guilty about that now, um, giving them that news in that way, but when you feel desperate and helpless like that, you do strange things. And and so, to me, my priority was, I just wanted to live, like that's what I was thinking in my head. I, I was just thinking, I'm gonna die, like what the hell is happening? How can I just be a normal person with everything going good? Surely if I have cancer, I'd have known about it, I'd have been bleeding, I'd have been in pain. I just remember for a good five days after being diagnosed, I felt like the only people in the world were me and Tom. I felt like everything stood still. Um, work didn't matter anymore. He took quite a few days off work, obviously. We didn't go to bed, we just sort of like stayed up and then dropped off to sleep for like two or three hours here and there because the thought of getting on as normal, how could you? Like, I knew I had a tumour going inside of me. That is the most scary thing you can ever be told. I suppose it is still pretty raw. Like, you don't talk about it in this sort of detail so much. So, I didn't realise that I would find it this difficult. Um, to be honest, I'm finding it actually quite therapeutic talking about it. But, but it is hard to think about those first few days after being diagnosed because the it was just so painful. Um, I was so scared and I've never felt so heartbroken in my life. I was told that the tumour was four by five centimetres and it had spread a little bit into like further further into the tissues surrounding the cervix so it was too far for me to have an operation to remove um my womb and everything or to have a hysterectomy if you like it was too far for that and I would need chemotherapy radiotherapy and I would be referred to the Christie in Manchester um it all happened so fast and have time for it to all process properly I'm gonna leave it there everybody so I'm sorry if this was quite upsetting to watch I didn't expect it to go like this but definitely opening up helps like i said i really hope that you can take something away from this video and um and yeah i will see you in my next one see you soon bye